One of the high priority leads the FBI is checking, an area man resembling the drawing of the suspect. He left his job last Friday, has not returned, but authorities will not comment further on that. Amy disappeared from the shopping center a week ago today. And today, FBI agents and Bay Village police were back in the center talking with people who might have been here then. Amy reportedly left Bay Square with a man she believed to be a friend sometime between 1 and 4 p.m. last Friday. The shopping center was busy, but few who were here remembered anything unusual about the man and the girl. What went on uh, was a ploy that was developed and carried through, and it looked like a natural uh, action going on. It didn't look out of the ordinary at all. Today, in that same 1 to 4 p.m. time frame, officers were trying to jog memories of shoppers to possibly recall something from a week ago that they did not consider important then. Okay, I'll be glad to Police want anyone else who was here last Friday afternoon to call them, regardless of whether they believe they saw anything. Police also are seeking other children who might have been contacted by phone, as Amy was, by a man as a friend, seeking the child's help in buying a gift for a parent. You have had some of those? Yes, we have. How many? I'm uh, aware of at least three, perhaps more. The sounds of rural Ashland County warn of a passing train, a tragedy averted. The sights along County Road 1181 warn of a tragedy committed. White ribbons have been strung in memory of Amy Mahalovic. Amy's body was discovered right alongside 1181 last week. The ground has been scraped by investigators for soil sample analysis. Another portion is covered with flowers left by shocked residents who now have more personal reasons to help in finding Amy's killer. Because he was bent down, so I couldn't see him that well. Larry Schuster has told the FBI an amazing story. On the day Amy's body was found, Schuster says he saw a suspicious-looking stranger drive back and forth near the discovery site. And he claims the driver looked very much like the police composite sketch of Amy's abductor. As I was leaving, coming up towards 224, that's when I seen him going back down again. Back up, I think he was coming up this way to see what was going on and see if anybody found him, found the girl. Amy Mahalovic is one girl this community will never forget, as a card on the flowers proclaims from the people of New London, Ohio. We're sorry, Amy. There is not only a sense of pity being shown by the people of Ashland County, but also a sense of precaution as well. Even though many neighbors tell me, in their opinion, Amy was probably killed someplace else, they say they plan to play it safe, just in case her abductor is still in the area. This is the land on which Kenneth Myers spent much of his life as a grain farmer and a frequent hunter. He says he now has frequent thoughts about Amy. I told my wife the other day, I said, you know, you see this on TV all the time where they go out in the country and find a body. I said, but you never figure it's going to happen right in your back door. Myers claims children are being watched more closely as well as property, while the community awaits the arrest of Amy Mahalovic's killer. In Ashland County, Jack Marshall reporting for the 10 o'clock news. Uh, I thank one and all for your support, your love, and your concern, without which I would not have been able to make it through this past year. A year ago today, just across the street from the tree and the granite marker, Amy was abducted from a Bay Village shopping center. A little more than three months later, her body was found. Let's fill the void that her passing has left with positive thoughts, with a smile on our face, and say she blessed our life for a while. Unfortunately, she is gone, but now we must live on. City and civic leaders and law enforcement officials spoke of love and community togetherness and the Amy Fund and the continuing search for the child's killer. And we're not going to give up until uh, we see this thing through. Uh, Amy has touched our lives. Uh, she will live forever. The monument says that Amy lives on in our hearts. Amy pulled a community together as a family and we still are a family supporting each other, loving each other. We know that Amy is in God's love and care, and his love and care are with us. There was mourning, and there were drawn faces, and there were some tears, but this was not a ceremony of sorrow. Put a smile on. <laughs> Thank you for coming. In Bay Village, John Harrington, Channel 3 News.
Friday, October 27th, 1989, Bay Village, Ohio. This should have been just a normal, typical Friday. The kids go off to school, the parents go to work, and when everyone gets home, we can start our weekend. But on this Friday, not everyone will come home. 10-year-old Amy Mahalovic went to school. She was in the fifth grade at Bay Village Middle School. After school, she walked with friends to the Bay Village Shopping Plaza. Amy was last seen that day by two of her peers. They would later report that they saw Amy Mahalovic standing outside of the Baskin Robbins ice cream shop. Amy was approached by a man in his early 30s standing about 5 foot 8 to 5 foot 10 inches tall, with dark hair and maybe a bald spot on the top of his head. One witness said the man was wearing a tan jacket and might have been wearing glasses, but could not be sure. The man walked right up to Amy, leaned down, and he said something to her. He placed his hand on Amy's back, and led her away. This man walked right up to her, spoke to her, and then took her. No one who saw the man with Amy knew who he was. And to this day, we don't know who he is. But we do know that he is a very, very evil man. Yesterday, February 8th, marked 31 years ago that the body of Amy Mahalovic was found after she had been missing for several months. And we were sitting there, Captain, on the 31-year anniversary. You sent me a text in the evening and said, hey, you probably already heard this, but there's supposed to be an Amy update and it might come today. And I text back saying, I've not heard anything. What's up? Well, we end up hearing that there was, in fact, going to be an update. And of course, then we're sitting on the edges of our seats wondering, did they finally make an arrest in this case? And it seems like with a lot of these major cases around the anniversaries, we will receive an update, but sometimes it's an update of no real significance. A lot of times it's just that we're still working the case. We're still asking the public for their help, their assistance. Please call in, email us a tip. Now with Amy's case, we've seen updates throughout the years and many people, many of our listeners have been following this case for a long time. And anybody that lives in Ohio knows this case. This was a national case. It was on America's most wanted And it's been featured throughout the years in several different venues. Now, in 2006, we had the update of new information that came out telling us that several other young girls in the area came forward announcing that they had received phone calls as well. This was information that was known to the police, but withheld from the public for many years. And then in 2013, we get the update that Phil Torsney retired FBI investigator was going to return from retirement simply to work on Amy's case periodically. Right. Then in 2016, we had one of the biggest updates in this case was the blanket and the curtain that was found located near Amy's body where her body was found and that there were fibers and hairs and such on these items that have connected them to Amy's case. Right. And that was big news that we, they did a press conference and everything. And you and I talked about what they found, what they released that day to the public. We've talked about that a lot, but the, the update that came out yesterday, I think could be more substantial and more significant to the case. Maybe possibly the biggest update that we've seen in 31 years. Well, not only a big update, but I, I also believe 
the information that they're giving is, is quite a bit. And even though the clip is only roughly five minutes long, there's some major, major points within that clip. And if this is the information that is being released to the public, how much more information does law enforcement have? Okay, Captain, let's all sit and listen together to this update. This is coming from News 5 out of Cleveland, and let's discuss what they are telling us 31 years later. Well, 31 years ago today, the body of a missing girl from Bay Village was found in a farm field in Ashland County. Now, more than three decades later, investigators have yet to charge anyone in the kidnapping and killing of Amy Mihaljevic. But the five on your side investigators recently uncovered newly filed court records showing investigators focusing in on a potential suspect. Investigator Scott Knoll has more of what he's discovered in a story you will only see here on News 5. These are the sworn statements from the lead investigator with Bay Village Police. In them, he says a woman came forward two years ago and identified her former boyfriend as a suspect in Amy Mihaljevic's murder. It's the case that shocked a community. There has been panic and paranoia. Ten-year-old Amy Mihaljevic kidnapped October 27th, 1989. Say lots and lots of prayers for Amy Renee Mihaljevic. Despite thousands of tips, prayers from the community, and a nationwide search, on February 8th, 1990, the search for Amy turned into the search for her killer. Mihaljevic's body found in a rural Ashland County farm field 50 miles away from the Bay Village Square shopping center where she was last seen talking to the man seen here in FBI composite sketches. It's believed the man in this composite sketch kidnapped the 10-year-old girl from the Bay Village shopping center. But who is he? Five on your side investigators discovered police now following up on a tip they received in January 2019. According to newly filed court documents, a woman told police she suspects her ex-boyfriend is Amy's killer. We're not naming him because he's not been charged with any crime. But according to an affidavit filed last fall, the woman told investigators she lived with the man less than a mile and a half from the shopping center where Amy was last seen. Police say the man had family in Bay Village, including a niece in the same grade as Mihaljevic. And the night Amy disappeared, court records show the woman told police the man never came home. However, the woman told police she did hear from the man that evening a phone call asking if she was aware of the news coverage on Amy's disappearance. And police say there's more. It had been having this on television for three months. Yeah. And then you wake up in the morning and find it's about 300 yards, find a body about 300 yards from your house. Police say they found gold fibers on Amy's clothing after her body was discovered. The detective told a Cuyahoga County judge the now 64 year old man drove a gold colored Oldsmobile with a tan interior at the time. And police say his former girlfriend recalls traveling to Ashland County with the man. We've also learned on the day Amy's body was discovered, an FBI agent was assigned to record all cars and license plates passing through a nearby intersection. Police say around 5 p.m. that evening, the agent recorded the man's gold Oldsmobile driving by. According to the detective, his investigation has not been able to show any reason why the man should have been there that day. We don't have like one suspect. We're like, yeah, this is the guy. But the same token, we have such a vast amount of information. I think it only going to take a couple pieces of information to tie all that together and actually solve it. Just days after Bay Village's former police chief told that to News 5, investigators say the man in question walked into the police department and talked to investigators over the course of two days. In a sworn affidavit, the detective said the man, quote, made very suspicious statements, including that 1989 and 1990 was a dark period in his life. According to court documents, the man initially told investigators Amy was never in his car, but when asked again if it was possible, investigators say the man said, okay, but I don't know what the situation would have been. The detective wrote the man also agreed it was possible his DNA would be on a curtain found near Amy's body and that his DNA would be on Amy's body, quote, if somebody planted it on her. Investigators say the man agreed to a DNA swab and also a polygraph test. Police say the result of that test was deception indicated. They also say the man did not show up the next day to sign paperwork, allowing them to search a storage unit. Instead, according to the detective, police got a warrant, searched the storage units, where, quote, 
officers seized evidence. Leading up to the 30th anniversary of his daughter's murder, Mahalovic's father told us he's still hopeful Amy's case will be solved. It's something that you can never stop thinking about. A case that after 31 years could be heating up. Police telling a judge that in May, two witnesses picked the man's picture out of photo lineups as the man they remember seeing Amy talking to the day she disappeared. So what else do we know about this man? Police say he's currently homeless and living in his car. We tried calling and texting him to ask about this case. We never got a response. We also tracked down the woman who came forward with this information. She referred us to investigators. But the Bay Village detective quoted in these court documents told us he wouldn't comment on what we found. In Bay Village, I'm Five on Your Side investigator Scott Knoll. If you have information about the murder of Amy Mahalovic, the FBI is offering a reward of up to $25,000 for tips that lead to the arrest and conviction in her death. Anyone with information is asked to call this number, 1-800-CALL-FBI. All right, so there's some major points there. Let me go over what I have. We have a woman comes forward to say that she thinks her ex-boyfriend possibly was involved or responsible for the death of Amy Mihalovic. He lived across the street from the shopping center or lived within less than a mile from the shopping center, had family in that area. His nieces were in the same grade as Amy, was not home the night that Amy was kidnapped Mm -hmm. calls her the night that Amy was kidnapped and ask her, are you seeing these news reports about Amy Mihaljevic drives a gold car, possible gold fibers found on her found on the curtains. Once they find her body in Ashland, which I believe is 50 miles away or so, Mm -hmm. or 50 minutes away. Roughly it's, it's 48 and change miles away. So they have an FBI agent set up to track cars in that area and guess whose car (laughs) was tracked the suspects so then he is interviewed by law enforcement he talks about 1989 and 1990 being a dark period in his life then basically agrees i guess they're questioning him saying well look is there any possible way that amy could have been in your car and he says no 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 okay well maybe but i don't know how that would have happened Then goes on to say, look, my DNA could be on the curtains that you found near her body where she was dumped. And yes, uh, they collect DNA evidence from him. Basically says if there's DNA from him on Amy's body, then that would have had to come uh, from somebody planting it. He takes a lie detector. Again, a lot of people iffy about lie detectors. I view them as a barometer. He failed the lie detector. That gives us a starting point, I think. Now, you have two eyewitnesses that come forward and pick this individual out of a lineup as the guy that they saw with Amy Mihalovic the day she was kidnapped at the strip mall. Did I miss anything? I don't I don't see anything that you missed, and uh, maybe we heard a couple things slightly different, but I think we can go through these items one at a time because I think what we have here, Captain... There's some things that we can easily pick up on from what they are saying, what they are releasing. But I also think that there might be some things that we can infer from what they're not saying. Right. Reading between the lines and applying what we know about the case to what they are now telling us. It's easy to listen to this clip and go, well, this might be the biggest update to date. Yeah. It's shocking. I'm not going to lie to you, man. When you text me yesterday, I thought, oh, here we go again. It's going to be something that is nothing. Often in Amy's case, what my experience has been following this case for so long is that when something new comes out, it's usually something that you can't put any weight to. It's something that you have to take with a grain of salt. It's someone that's all of a sudden realizing something, remembering something, or connecting 
some dots over something that happened 20, 25, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. And you go, okay, well, they're, they're remembering this now all of a sudden. Therein lies my biggest question in this information. Why, if we're just hearing about this from what they told us, January 2019, this woman comes forward and says, I believe my ex-boyfriend could have been involved in the abduction of Amy Mihaljevic. Right. Why, why 29 years later? Is there, is there a reason for that? Now, what I, what I will say, reading between the lines here, there has to be something very important in her statements to police Mm -hmm. because they got a job to do, not just in Amy's case in other cases, they have a, a public to protect on the daily. There must've been something in there because we can tell by other things that are stated in that news report that police have spent a lot of time, effort and resources on looking into this tip. Yeah. Normally I'd say, Oh, here's this woman coming forward about ex boyfriend. Is this some kind of revenge? So much time has passed. I believe, or what my gut is telling me is that she found out something about this individual probably in 2018, maybe 2000, 19 that made her go light bulb. Maybe she suspected it for years, but there was something that triggered her to go. I have to go to the police. Now we're going off a of memory here today. Captain, we didn't know until last night that there was going to be an update in it, an update this big. And so no time to go through all of our notes and all of everything we've reported in the past on this case. So forgive me if we if we stray or get something wrong here, but this is a very important update. This is very important and like I said there's got to be something in her statement to police that made them really dive in and investigate this this tip so thoroughly. Now, some people out there listening are going to go, "Well, duh, Nick, it's because she said he didn't come home that night and I did speak with him that night because he called me to ask me if I had seen the news coverage or heard Mm -hmm. the news coverage about Amy having gone missing or the abduction of this child. That cannot be the answer. That's not why they dove into this thing so deeply. So let's move past that. And I say that because I'm awfully curious about that part of this tip, because from my understanding, that news coverage did not come out until 10 30, 11 o'clock at night. She went missing right after school. Right. So now we have a big window of time already that's elapsed before. I I couldn't imagine he's calling her, asking her if she's seen the news coverage, but heck captain, maybe that is the tip. Maybe that is the iceberg because Mm. maybe she's saying, well, it hadn't even come on the news yet. Right. But then that's when you have to take another step back and go, okay, well then again, why 29 years later, that's something that should have been, that should have clued you in immediately that night, the next day that you are pounding on the door, pounding on the desk at police headquarters saying this guy's involved. He's telling me about it before the public even knew that she was abducted. Right. But we don't know the character of this individual. So again, it's could be something that she suspected for a while, but then found out some new information. And that was the trigger to go, Hey, I, go to law enforcement. But this news report is perfect because one, they set it up. Woman comes forward to say that her ex-boyfriend could have been involved in the murder of Amy Mihaljevic. And then they connect some dots. Okay. One, he lived less than a mile away from the shopping center. Okay. So that's a good location. That means that individual should be looked at. I, I have in my notes, Captain, not to cut you off, but I have in my notes a mile and a half, less than a mile and a half from the shopping plaza. Yeah, but very close. That's walking distance, or that would be quick to, if he took her from the shopping center back to his place, we have a caller telling Amy to meet him at the shopping center. So just anybody in that location that connects them to the case. But also we have the fact that he has nieces in the same grade as Amy. So how could he have got Amy's number? He could have got it from one of his nieces. He could have had some kind of obsession with Amy Mihaljevic, 
could have got information from from his nieces, and the nieces aren't going to question why is my uncle asking me about one of my classmates. They could have just been walking together at some point. But then he's not home the night that she's kidnapped, and then he makes the call. Hey, have you seen this footage? So right there, that is enough of a connection to the case to at least put him on a suspect list. Yeah, and let's go ahead and take it a step further with all the other items that they found. It it makes him even a, a much better suspect. He's, from what little we know already, to me, he's as good as any suspect that has been discussed before in the past. And I know on our show, we've talked about several we went through at least five that I can think of in, in five in really good detail. We planned on discussing five more at some point. I'm kind of guessing who this possibly could be because he is not named and rightfully so not named in this news article or in the news coverage. But I can't believe that he was anybody that was already on my radar Right. And maybe not on anyone else's either, unless there's a chance his name was already in the case file somewhere, or he was already on police's radar, and that was enough to get a tip. To get another person to come forward and bring up his name again was enough for them to really dive in deep. Now, if he lived less than a mile and a half from the shopping plaza, that would mean, let's pretend that he is the perpetrator. Okay, that's one thing we really need to point out here. There's not been an arrest made yet. This guy's not been brought up up on charges yet. So it's 50-50 at this point if this is even our guy or not. But let's say it is. So that means he would have known a good deal more about the area than, than I had suspected. Right. What I've always thought, is that this person knew that there is a direct link between the shopping plaza and Amy's school. They they need to know enough that this would be a place that Amy would feel comfortable going to on her own to get her to meet him there and then abduct her from that location. Amy's situation is very much an abduction that took place before Amy even realized she had been abducted. Right. It was a ruse. He tricked her into going to the plaza, tricked her into his vehicle, and at some point, she realized what was going on. We're not going shopping like this guy told me. We're not going where he said we were going. So he picked the location that she would have been comfortable enough to leave her school at the end of the day, go to willingly by herself. We always kind of knew that. But what's interesting here is if he lived that close... This was not something he just picked up in passing. He would have known that the police department, the Bay Village Police Department, is located in that exact area. It's it's practically right next to the plaza. So that's very, very bizarre to, in my opinion, to, to know that and go, all right, I'm going to go into the belly of the beast to make this abduction. I'm going to do this in the backyard of the police department. So we have the girlfriend that comes forward saying she believes possibly her ex-boyfriend could be involved. That seems to have taken place in January of 2019. Then in May, we have two witnesses and you have to believe captain. They're the two witnesses that were at the plaza that day. Right. That said they saw a man talking with Amy I like the fact that they picked this individual out of a photo lineup. Yes, picked this guy out of a photo lineup. And, of course, they probably figured out a way to get some old photos of this guy. So they're showing these witnesses pictures of what this guy looked like in 89 or 90. Well, and we haven't really had that communication from law enforcement. I mean, some of the major suspects, you take like Dean Runkel, for example, none of those eyewitnesses ever came forward and said, Yeah, you know what? Now that I'm thinking about it, it was Dean Runkle I saw. Right. They never came out and said that. So now you have, I I just find that incredible. And could you imagine these eyewitnesses that have lived with this horror, not being able to answer certain questions that you know could solve this case for law enforcement, for Amy's family, and to finally, all these years later, to be looking at a photo and go, that's the guy. 
and I finally can give law enforcement answers. I mean, they had to feel good about that. Yes. And so we have the two witnesses pick this guy out of a photo lineup. Like you said, we've not had any obvious statements from police in the past saying we have people who have identified Dean Runkle as someone seen at the plaza that day. The best we have on Runkle is that a vehicle that was very similar to his, if not identical, was spotted behind, I believe it was behind the plaza parked there that day. That vehicle would have been a fairly common vehicle for the time. Right. So you can't say it was, in fact, Dean Runkles. You can just say it it does not eliminate him. That's what's great about this update, though. This is is different, as you're pointing out. Yeah. Well, yeah, but, I mean, has there been talk about the gold fibers being fibers that they believe came from an automobile? Yes, and that's part of the problem with Runkle is that the vehicle he had at the time would have had an interior that that it would have been possible for those fibers to come from. Now, again, not a uncommon vehicle, right? Other vehicles have similar fibers. No one's saying that they are an exact match and fiber analysis is really up to the judgment of the, of the person giving you the analysis. Mm -hmm. It's not an exact science, but this gold Olds Oldsmobile vehicle with tan interior as they say in this new update in the new news article, this does not eliminate this guy either. You would expect to find similar fibers in that vehicle. And then what we have here is a bit of an interrogation, right? Because police say this guy in his favor, in his favor, he willingly walks into the police department and sits down and talks with detectives. He's there to, Ask them some questions, I'm sure, but also to proclaim his innocence, to tell them why he's not involved. And this is all just a big misunderstanding. Right. But what's interesting here is what kind of trickles out from that interrogation. I do want to say this going into it. I don't find really anything that this guy says in their release to be suspect. I I don't think I do. It doesn't make me go, okay, draw a circle around this guy, underline his name. He's the guy that did it because the release says is that, okay, he showed some signs of deception in the polygraph. Yeah. And that could just be nerves. Here's the thing, man. If somebody knocked on my door 29, 30, 31 years after the fact of some cold case homicide, Mm -hmm. and let's say I had nothing to do with it. I didn't even know who this person was. I'm not going to lie, Captain. I would be nervous as hell going, what do these guys got that has put me in this chair today with these wires hooked up to me answering questions? Well, again, I I also think we we have evidence now that he's living in his car. Look, a lot of people that deal with homelessness have mental health issues, drug addiction issues. Obviously, that would be happening when he's being interrogated by the police the police so him being deceptive on the polygraph again it could be nerves it could be the guy has a drinking problem it could be the guy has a drug problem the guy has some mental health issues and those can stop you from passing a polygraph test so i i don't put a lot of weight into that i also don't put a lot of weight into well 89 and 90 were dark periods of my life we don't know what was happening in his life or did family members pass away in, in, in his life. I don't even find it that incriminating for him to say, okay, maybe Amy was in my car, but I don't know how that would have happened. That, it makes, that makes me wonder if he ever gave his nieces rides to school or ever picked them up from school, ever drove them to a friend's house, ever drove his nieces and some of their friends around. Or if he loaned his car out at any time. And therein lies some of the the issues. So that stuff that comes out makes him sound very suspicious, very guilty. But let's keep in mind, that sounds to me like they this was a thorough interrogation. And I'm using that word, I'm picking, I'm choosing that word interrogation over interview. Because I think... When he walked in and said, I agree to sit down with detectives and talk, I'm here. You don't have to come and find me. 
I'm happy to talk with detectives. At some point, if you like this guy or if you think that he's done something, this meeting, this interview flips from an interview to an interrogation. And I think that's what happened at some point. Or no, it's, sometimes it's not even flipped. It's just from the word jump. And know? we've seen this in other cases where they're going to press and press and press. So did you pick up Amy at the plaza that day? No. Was Amy Maholovic ever in your vehicle? No. Right. Is there any reason that we would think that she was in your vehicle? Is there any reason why we would find evidence that she would have been in your vehicle? At some point, you press and press and press to the point where he's going to break a little bit and say he's either going to confess and tell you something that he was lying about before, or he's left with no other choice to say, okay, I'm not saying that it is 100% impossible right. that she would have ever have been in my vehicle at any time. I'm just saying I I don't know what the situation would be that she would have been in my vehicle. Right, and law enforcement could be going, hey, look, douche canoe, right? Douche burger. We have fibers that match the same fibers of the car that you owned at that time. And we have eyewitnesses that can prove that you owned that car at that time. Or we have pictures of you with that car. Well, they can and go the, back and check his, his license and res- registration, too. If if he registered the vehicle in his name, then there's no disputing that he owned a vehicle that make and model that year at that time. Right, and sometimes the questioning becomes not good questioning. Damien Eccles questioning, right? Where they'd ask you, well, how would you explain that if they matched? Okay, if you if that is the questioning, then the answer could be, well, I don't know if if she was ever in my car, I don't know why she would be. So that that answer sounds pretty bad, but in context, I'm not so much. But here's my issue. One, but what about the DNA on the curtains? There's two questions. They ask him about B- DNA on the curtains and DNA on Amy Mahalovic's body. The answer for the DNA on Mah- Amy Mahalovic's body is somebody would have had to plant it there. That, again, makes me think that they're asking him questions that he's going, well, I don't know, but I guess if it was on her body, somebody had to plant it there. But when they ask about the curtains, it doesn't seem like he said, well, they had to plant it on the curtains. He's saying it's possible my DNA might be on the curtains. Maybe that's just the way I'm taking it from the report, but it's almost like he's willing to admit that his DNA might be on those curtains. But if it's on Amy, it was planned. Yeah. Again, it goes back to the question that we've seen in the past. And and you referenced exactly what I was thinking of was the West Memphis three case where when that case broke and they were interviewing people in the neighborhood and surrounding neighborhoods, Mm -hmm. especially when they started talking to, um, you know, this was going on before, Damian Eccles was questioned. This, these were questions that they were giving to everybody and, or at least the majority of the people that they spoke with. And these questions were provided to West Memphis by the FBI. Okay. Here's the, I don't remember the exact number for whatever reason, nine or 12 pops in my head, Mm -hmm. but here's the nine or 12 questions that we, the FBI, if we were conducting a door to door search and question what we, what we would be asking the people. And one of those questions was, can you explain why we would find your fingerprints at the crime scene? Well, the innocent answer is you would not find my fingerprints at the crime scene. Right. Uh, The innocent answer or the intelligent answer. Right now, the confused answer or guilty answer Mm -hmm. is you try to explain it away. Either you're guilty. You did it. You now have to explain away why your fingerprints are there. Or if you're just a confused individual, confused by the question, you need a lawyer and you're, you're the one that's trying to explain away. They never said we found your fingerprints right. at the crime scene. We're just asking why can you explain why we might find your fingerprints at the, at the crime scene? This is an, this is like the oldest trick in the book 
by investigators. It's I've seen it in in very low level crimes too. This is actually something that I used when when I worked security. I I had somebody that took out a fence, took out the whole side of of a, a big expensive fence that we had on one of our properties. Mm-hmm. I knew who did it. And I could tell by the marks on his truck and the marks on on the fence itself, they lined up perfectly. However, on my surveillance footage of that spot, there was a wall blocking it, blocking the camera from that particular view that showed his truck taking out that whole row of fence. Mm -hmm. But I knew he did it. And so I just said to him, he, he refused to admit, refused to admit. And then finally I said to him, well, why would I then explain to me why I would have footage, camera footage. And I pointed to the camera and he looked up and he said, oh, crap, there's a camera right there. I was driving in this area. I never told him I had actual footage of it. I just said, explain why I would have footage of right. of you of you taking out my fence. Now, that's the same thing that they're doing here. They're saying, okay, why would we find your DNA on the curtain? Why would we find your DNA on Amy? And he's probably starting off going, my that's not my dna i don't know what you're talking about i was never there i've never seen that curtain before in my life those questions then turn to at some point going okay so sir you are telling us that it is 100 percent impossible that we would find your dna on that curtain it's impossible to shove a cadillac up your nose it's 100 percent mm. impossible that we would find your dna on this dead victim yeah but again, and at some point he's he's breaking a little bit or he's smart enough to go i'm not saying it's impossible i'm just saying i didn't put it there i'm just saying i cannot tell you why you would find it there because i don't believe that you will find it there again i don't know the notes that the news has but the way they make it come across is he's going and eh, dna on the curtains possible dna on her somebody would have had to plant that. So that's, we have all these things that I go, good suspect. We have somebody coming forward. I think there's a reason she came forward. There was a, there was a light bulb moment. There could have been a conversation. This guy could have called her and said something. And it was just enough for her to go. I knew it. I got to go to a law, law enforcement. So I liked that. I liked the fact that he would have been familiar with this area. I have always thought, Again, like you said, to do this right underneath the noses of the police department, to me, that's either somebody is very brazen or they have a knowledge of that area. Now we have the connection with his nieces and Amy being in the same grade. He could get information from them. He could get information from the school because if he's not that far away from the plaza, he's not that far away from the school. Mm -hmm. And... I know from picking up nieces and nephews, I've gone in and talked to the people in the offices. I probably could have got information. Oh, my niece and nephew are going to Amy's house on Thursday. Could you give me her number so I could call her parents to make sure that's okay? Well, it wasn't uncommon for her to, to ride her bike to and from school. So one could simply follow her home. Right. And then look up the address. Look up the address. The other thing that people do not as much nowadays, but a lot of times back then in the eighties and and early nineties, people would put their last name on their mailbox. Yeah. Well, here's, here's the other thing. I wonder how close were his nieces to Amy? Police would know that. Obviously we don't know that from this report, but also when they say, and I think this is a little bit of a tell and maybe I'm reaching, but when they go, he had family in the area. Yeah. Okay. You already told us that his nieces were connected to her but why are you bringing up well his family was in bay village i wonder if there's a connection between his family and the mahalovics uh and that might be something that we hear about later later again all these things are like great indicators that this individual should be on our list but then you have again the fbi agent in ashland if i'm getting the information correct from the report They made it seem like, okay, once her body was found, we had FBI agents in the vicinity. Mm -hmm. And so we started just writing down license plate numbers, knowing 
that somebody might come back to the scene to see what is going on. And this individual was 50 miles away from Bay Village, and his car is reported to be at that four-way stop. Okay, to me, that's the got him. Yeah, that's by far and away the most damning portion of this release to me. Well, because they never state, oh, by the way, he had uh, work in Ashland County, or by the way, he had family there. They go out of their way to say, we cannot find any reason why he would have been in that area at that time on that day. And then on top of that, his ex-girlfriend's telling them something again. Look, we've had reports where they come out and go, we got this curtain, and we think it was handmade, and does anybody recognize that? And that's it. That's one piece of information. Everybody take a picture. Uh, there's a $25,000 reward from the FBI. We're talking about 12 to 14 little bits of information. And, and this is a department that has held back things for years. I also think another thing that is like, okay, car in the area, but when the ex-girlfriend confirms, oh, yeah, we traveled to Ashland County. Again, what does that mean? I think there's more information there. Like, well, we traveled there for this reason, but law enforcement isn't giving us that reason. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, he could have had family in the area or or made up any reason at all to to bring his girlfriend with him to that area. Right. But, um, you know, that's why when I spoke with, with Kelsey German, um, from the Libyan Abbey case, the Delphi double homicide case. When I spoke with Kelsey German, she is the older sister of one of the victims. She was involved in the searches before the bodies were located. And I knew that to be the case. She was involved in the searches the night before and the morning of, I specifically asked her one of the, one of the biggest questions I had for her was, do you remember now, Mind you, it might be a little different for Kelsey's situation because she is a direct family member, a sister of one of the victims, sister of one of the people they're searching for. But I asked her, I said, I know you were part of the search parties. Do you recall law enforcement making you sign any kind of sign-in sheet and provide any type of identification before they allowed you to go out on these searches? And she said, Nick, I do not recall that taking place. That does not mean it did not happen. Right. It doesn't mean that there wasn't a sign-in sheet for everybody else, or she just doesn't remember. But what I said to her, and I didn't go into too much detail with this, but these guys often want to know what law enforcement knows because they want to know how close these guys are to catching the perpetrator. They, they want to know, should I flee the area? Has it gotten too hot here? Too hot in the hot tub. That I need to just get out of Dodge at this point? And I told her, I said, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if the bridge guy was in the search parties. And I hope that law enforcement collected those names and checked IDs and that at least his name is on a list somewhere. Now, with this case, this dude, there's no getting around it. Even if he's innocent, this guy, we know for a fact, his vehicle was spotted, license plate written down by FBI agent in the area at the four-way stop nearest the body recovery site on the day at 5 p.m. when her body was discovered. Now, what's interesting about that is that This was, again, this case was big news, big news so much so in the area that even though 50 miles away, 48, 50 miles away from where Amy was abducted, you talk to those sheriff deputies and you review the old newspaper articles. The sheriff's deputies all said the same thing. When we got the call and what was described to us that we were responding to out on that country road. I was pretty convinced on the drive there 
we were going to find Amy Mahalovic's body. 48 miles away from where she was abducted. Right. That's how big of a news it was. Everybody was looking for this girl for months. And so the the police law enforcement aren't dumb. You know, I know I know that some cases get bungled, some cases get screwed up. Not in all cases are they dumb. All right? This is a case where they weren't. We had the FBI, we had other people involved very early on in this case from the first weekend. And what did they do strategically? They know this is going to get released. There's going to be a big news releases about this. They were smart enough to say, you know what? This may be a big, huge waste of time, or it could be something that turns out to be extremely valuable later. Let's put some guy, have him jot down all the license plates, all the vehicle descriptions that, that come through this four way stop all day long. And you know what? They spotted this dude's vehicle yeah. around the five o'clock hour in this area. Now, how do you explain that away? Again, maybe he did in the interrogation, but they're not, again, releasing that information. But like I said, a lot of other updates in many cases are one piece of evidence or one item to discuss. Here we have 14 or more. So what else does law enforcement know? And I also feel like, if this is nothing that cops would not go and have an update because this is just really setting yourself up for failure to get the community excited that there's finally going to be an arrest that there's finally going to be justice for this girl, for her family. But a couple of things that lead me to be, you know, suspicious of this is he did give his DNA. Yeah. And so why hasn't that been tested or were the items that it was tested against? Is there something that's um, causing it to be inconclusive? So they need to build a bigger case. The other thing, which I don't think is that damning, which they, you know, start going, uh, uh-huh, he, he was supposed to show up so we could go through his items in the storage unit and he never came in. Well, that could be simply he, again, has a drug problem, a drinking problem, mental health issues, whatever reason he's on the streets now. This could have caused him from, or prevented him from going back to law enforcement and going, here's my key to search my stuff. But to search his stuff, they go, okay, well, he, he was supposed to give us permission. He didn't. So now we have to get a warrant. It's not the easiest thing to get that warrant, but they got it fast. And it could be a couple things. One, it's just been a cold case for so long that any judge is going to go, Hey, any lead that we get, especially a a new lead, a viable lead, I'm going to sign it off. Or is it that there was so much, uh, circumstantial evidence that they went, yes, yeah, go, go search this I unit. think that's the answer, Captain. I think that that's what you have because if you if you go through the timeline of that very brief uh, news release, what we hear is this tip comes forward January of 2019 from the ex-girlfriend. Then in May, two witnesses pick this guy out of a photo lineup. And then it's not until last fall that they have the conversation Mm -hmm. with this guy. Now, again, in his defense, I'll go to bat for him briefly and say what looks good for this guy to being innocent. He willingly walks into the police department, agrees to sit down and and chat with with detectives. It sounds to me, and I, again, I'm trying to read between the lines here because it's not an incredibly detailed report, which the news can only give what they have. Right. And it sounds to me like he offered up his DNA, that he agreed to a DNA swab that day at that meeting. Now, and then it goes on to say the next day he was supposed to come in and sign a search warrant for us to go look at his, um, what was it, like a self-storage unit? Yeah. We want to search your storage unit, come in and sign this waiver for us. He does not show up for that. Now- Now you're going in front of a judge, and now what you're saying, Captain, is you're going, okay, look, 
okay, we I understand we got this tip, but we've we've had a thousand bad tips, obviously, a thousand tips that led nowhere. So you're not getting a warrant just on the tip. But judge, we got a tip, and then we were able to go back and confirm through state records, through county records, that this guy registered a vehicle in his name that matches that would have an interior that would line up with the fibers that we found at the body recovery site. Oh, we also have two witnesses that picked them out of a photo lineup. So what you have here, Captain, is a lot of dominoes start falling in the favor of police getting this actual warrant. And, Judge, we talked to him just yesterday, failed the polygraph. Oh, and he said that it wouldn't be impossible that we would find his DNA at the crime scene, at yeah. the body recovery site. Yeah. We... We checked the FBI records. We we know that his vehicle was in the area the day that we recovered her that, body. That's the biggest one. Right You're then right. you go, oh, man, you a scallywag. You, you use a dirty son of a bitch. You use a dirty son of a bitch. Uh, no, but- and so you get the warrant, and then you go and you search the, the storage unit, and then what's their statement in that news release? It says evidence collected. Now. Let's let's dive into that for a second because it can't be anything that's super damning, super against this guy because they would have arrested him. They would have went and found this dude and locked him up, and we would have already been hurt hearing about charges filed in a in a trial date set. But that that doesn't mean it's not evidence that's not supporting their case. If they're collecting right. anything, whatever it's, they collected is supporting their case against the son of a bitch. I agree. What I'm what I'm saying is that it could not. I would be shocked if they found any of Amy's missing items in his storage unit, because I think if they found any of those items and can could, could confirm that they were from Amy, and I don't even know that you have to confirm that they're from Amy, because the items that were missing, you know, when they found her, she's found fully clothed, but some of her items that she left with school at the end of her school day, and it was never seen for a couple of months until her body was found. Right. Those items that are missing are quite unique. Yes. They're they're not they're not one of a kind, but there's also not thousands of them out there. Yeah, I think like you said, there would be a an arrest. What I think is interesting that what we are hearing or maybe not so much hearing in this uh news release, I think is better to say it, is things that are not surprising to me. Um one, we hear that this man is sixty four years old today. Right. Okay, so 31 years ago would make him 32, 33 years of age at the time of her abduction. You know, I've always thought this guy's in his mid-30s. And I went off of that idea simply because of what the two eyewitnesses said. Mm. I thought Amy was talking to her dad. Right. And we know it was not Mark Mahalovic that she was talking to. What, what I gather from that statement of the eyewitnesses that day at the plaza, they are children. These witnesses, they are kids that are roughly Amy's age saying, I thought she was talking to her dad. Well, why would a kid think that they're thinking that because the man looked to be about the age one would expect her father to be right. Or these witnesses have fathers about the same age, meaning this guy was in that age group. And so that's not so surprising to me. Early thirties, 32, 33. The other thing too, is what, what is not said is is a direct connection to the Mahalovic family. As you kind of were pointing out earlier, family in the area. I think that's a tell. He had family in the Bay Village area. What's that matter? You know, because we already talked about the nieces. I, I, I think there's something more to that. But well, again, like I said, we've seen in tons of cases, one item discussed on anniversaries. We're talking about 14 freaking items that means there, there there could be so much more to this, and maybe that's just me being hopeful. But I also think it seems like at some point, like you said, they, they contact this individual and he goes in willingly to talk to the police, maybe nervous, maybe has some issues. But if he's living in his car in northeast Ohio. Is that what they said? He's he's living. I know they said he's living in his car, but did they say he's living in his car in Northeast Ohio? No, they just said he could be homeless anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Technically, that's the definition, right? Um, no, they didn't say they didn't say he was even in Ohio. Um, 
So, but if he, let's just say he's living in Northeast Ohio, that's some rough weather to be living in your car. And the other thing too, and here's what I was wondering. He could just be down on his luck, a little bit of a loner. Cause most adults do not go homeless. They normally have some kind of support system. Normally they get turned away because of, you know, mental health issues or, or drug addictions. I was uh, talking to an investigator last night about this and, you know, 64, he could be collecting social security, but I believe that he would be eligible for his full amount when he's 65. So maybe his whole thought was like, well, I'm going to be homeless for a little bit, but eventually I'm going to get my check. And once I start getting my social security, then I'll be able to get an apartment or something. But they also don't state whether this guy had a criminal history. They didn't say that he didn't have any prior arrest. We don't know if this guy is a a sex offender. We we just don't know. And I, I, I believe that, again, and this is just based off of how many cases that we've done updates on and the updates just aren't that much of information. This seems like a lot of information. And I just don't think they would give that to the public if they weren't close. Right. And and maybe it's a couple things. We're close, so now we need some people to go. Uh, and it sucks because you don't want to release the guy's name. Because technically he's just a suspect and he hasn't been charged. But if they released a picture of this guy or they released something else that might jog somebody else's memory because maybe he confessed to somebody years ago. So I think there's going to be more tips that come in, but I think they're building a case against this guy. Well, I think what's going on here, a a couple things, and you really hit on a lot. So let, let me kind of go into a few of these things here first. And I can't speak to how it is everywhere. But I know from growing up, born and raised in Columbus, here in Columbus, for the most part, if you're homeless, you're kind of homeless by choice. And what I mean by that is, look, I understand everybody falls on hard times. We're not always in control of every minute of of every day of our lives. However, here in Columbus, multiple shelters that one could go to to stay the night, you you can sleep here for night after night. You can eat here day after day, night after night. However, our shelter has rules. It has a curfew. And the people that don't stay at those shelters are people that do not want to or cannot follow those rules or obey that curfew. Yeah, but a lot of these uh, food banks and stuff, I mean, he, he could technically be living off some of the systems in place for the homeless, like as far as food banks maybe even going to a YMCA or a shelter where you can take baths or take showers. But again, like you said, I'm not choosing to stay there because if I just stay in my car overnight, I don't have to follow those rules. What if he is living in one of those uh, decked out $100,000 Mercedes Sprinter vans that has like the bed and TV and stuff in it? I don't think so. And, and this guy's like, man, y'all... Y'all done me dirty. You said I'm sleeping in <laughs> sleeping in my vehicle. Made me sound like I'm homeless when really I got this decked out vehicle. I, I'm with you. I don't think that's the case, but that <laughs> that funny thought popped in my mind. Well, here's what makes me wonder. This individual is not going to hear. Whenever he hears about this update. Cause he guess, will hear it. Yeah. Guess what? Because he wants to hear it. Because this individual is talking about... Um, the coverage of her the day she went missing. This guy's following the case. So he's going to hear this. What I'm afraid of is suicide. The guy taking his own life and they don't have enough pieces of the puzzle to completely convict him. Well, it also sounds like he's slightly off the grid anyway. I mean, even though they were able to locate him, um, it did say that the, that news five, Cleveland did try to contact this individual. So they must have his phone number to which he's not responding. Yes. Suicide would be terrible because if in fact he was the guy that did it, we may never know. Well, unless he wrote a note 
that would leave enough evidence for for the police to close the case. Or if the DNA could connect them at some point. Yeah. Because and, we know he gave the swab. The other thing, too, that you have to worry about is the guy fleeing the area. And then now it's it's not a matter of suicide, but it makes him that much more difficult to locate when you do, you said building a case against this guy, once you have built your case and you're ready to charge him, now you got to go find the dude. Well, one of the things about the DNA was I was going, oh, okay, well, she comes in in January and then they get DNA. Okay, well, they should have this tested by now, but. Well, but he, keep he in mind the DNA the would have come from last fall. Right. And then plus with all the stuff with COVID, I think all the tests and everything, everything has been on hold and they they could actually have some kind of a match and then they they want to retest it to confirm the match but that might be something that they have to do through the court system which has also been tied up because of covid and i i want everybody to be very very clear about this i think that if dna connected him to that curtain or to her actual body or articles of clothing on her person he'd be arrested he's arrested and we would already have a trial date so what I want to say here is this update, following this update, it's very clear. They are asking the public once again for their help, as they would do on any anniversary of the abduction date, body recovery date, or just when we need the public's help. Any update you're going to get, please call in, give us a tip. We need your help. We need some more information. I want everybody to do not say, if you know something at all, do not say to yourself, I'm not going to report this or I'm not going to tell this to somebody else or talk to somebody about this. And I mean law enforcement when I say somebody because they've got this guy's DNA, so it can't be him. That's not what they are saying. No. Nobody is saying that. It's very likely, let's pretend it is him. They just need a little bit more. They need a little bit more. DNA didn't connect them for whatever reason. We need a little bit more. And... Let's take this a little step further here. The interesting words towards the end of that news coverage and applaud News 5. Good work. I, I applaud them. Fantastic job by News 5, giving us probably the biggest update in the Amy Mahalovic case that we've had in 31 years. Towards the end there, they say what we found, what we found, what News 5 found, that they found the court records. We found documents in court records that has spawned this news release, that has spawned us asking Bay Village Police Department for more information, Right. that has spawned us reaching out to this lady who provided the tip, to which the lady just refers them, rightfully so, back to law enforcement. This news coverage comes out on February 8th, 2021, 31 days, 31 years to the day that her body's recovered. That's not a coincidence. Come on. I wasn't born 10 minutes ago. It's a boy. This is the, the police gave this to news five. Uh -huh. That's that. Look, crispy Colonel, humble opinion, dumb guy in a garage. Don't believe everything I'm saying. Noted. But my guess here is this was given to news five purposely on the date of the anniversary of the body recovery, because there's tidbits of information in there that people that know this individual or suspect this individual can start connecting the dots mentally and they can pick up the phone. They can email there. We're not going to tell you this guy's name. We're not going to show you his picture because he's not been charged with anything. We're doing right by him. However, we will say he's 64 years old. He's homeless. Mm -hmm. He has a cell phone. He's living in his car. Maybe a house phone. <laughs> just so there are things that okay now people can go all right do i do i know do i know somebody that's 64 living in their car that, that is was living in bay village a, a mile mile and a half from the shopping plaza in 1989 right there's where they go on to say had family living in the area that they're speaking to this man's family by saying that yeah or look look we've seen the fbi suggest to law enforcement you got all this stuff on this guy put it out to the public because it's not going to affect your case and it's going to put pressure it's almost like having a press conference where the deputy says we know who you are and we're on to you 
Mm-hmm. It's almost the same thing. Mm-hmm. By putting out this much information in the news coverage, it's almost the same thing. And maybe they want to say, let's see how he reacts. And for all we know, they're planning on pulling him in today and discussing this with him today yeah. and asking him some more questions or basically telling him, hey, we don't have a 100% match on the DNA, but we got enough that we can take you to trial. And to see see if they can get a confession out of this guy, that might be what they're intending to do. I don't think law enforcement or even news, even if they stumbled upon this information, are going to release something like this that is going to give so mu- so much hope to the community and possibly so much hope to her family. The biggest things here, my biggest takeaways, if I if I had to pick two. It says Carr is in Ashland County, and we know that from the FBI and the two eyewitnesses picking him out of a photo lineup. Those are the two biggest things I take away from this news report. So what we can pull from this news release and what we can really ask the public for their help with is to think long and think hard. Can you, anybody out there in listener land, Can you think of a man, or maybe you knew a man that was 32, 33 years roughly at the time of Amy's abduction, at the time of Amy being found, that would own or drive a vehicle, a gold Oldsmobile with a tan interior, were you picked up by some guy that behaved strangely, were you abducted by someone and just were too embarrassed to come forward? Do you know this guy in any shape or form or fashion? And keep in mind, look, her body is found on Township Road 1181 in Ashland County in February 8th of 1990. This is near New London, Ohio. Her body was dressed in her clothing, the clothing that she was seen wearing the last time that she was seen. But there were items that were missing from Amy when she was recovered a turquoise horse earring, black ankle boots, and a black leather binder. And it was believed, and and remains so to this day, that her abductor kept these items or forgot or failed to dump them with the body for some reason. So are you somebody out there that received one of these items from someone matching that age description? matching somebody that owned that type of vehicle at some point. That's what we need. That's what that's what they're hoping for, amongst other things, in this. If, in fact, they did purposely leak it, it's because they want some more information. As Captain said, they're building a case against this guy, and you could help. Maybe you could help solve one of the biggest unsolved cases in the state of Ohio. Now, remember, there's still a reward out there for information leading to an arrest and conviction, a reward of up to $25,000. And if you have any tips at all, of course, you can reach out to the Bay Village Police Department or the FBI by calling 1-800-CALL-FBI. And just a word to the suspect, if, if he is listening, this could all be over with. You could turn yourself in. You can confess to the crime you could give law enforcement the evidence they need to convict you well and if you want leniency the time is now if you're the suspect if you've done this the time is now to get any kind of leniency at all because once they've built a solid case against you judges are way too smart to show any leniency to a guy that they've already built a case against right so your time's running out your time the clock is ticking You need to just turn yourself in today. A little bit of a different episode this week, but one of the things that we always said we would do is to give updates on cases. We wouldn't just do coverage, shine light on a case, and move away from it. We we want all these cases to move forward 
to progress when there's updates we're going to let you know and most of the time you can find those updates on our other show it's everybody's second favorite podcast out there because this one's the first number one podcast in the world true crime garage number two podcast in the world off the record which is available only on stitcher premium check it out go to our website if you want a free month of listening until next time be good be kind and don't litter